talk a little bit about the down deep ocean regions. In particular, I want to talk about stuff that's, that's fairly far down. Here's a quick outline of what we're going to talk about today. So um, we're going to review what we, what we touched on the other uh, lecture, a couple lectures ago, about um, location-based uh, names for places. And the, the key concepts that, that are going to drive, uh, drive our, our concerns or drive the patterns we see in terms of things down deep are going to be the, the three-dimensionality of the aquatic world that is the ocean, which is mostly different from where you and I live, which is mostly a two-dimensional world uh, in this context. Light is a big uh, theme here. Lack of light, generating light, that kind of stuff. Um, and then energy. Where does the energy come from to, to power these systems? And then we'll talk about two particular examples. One will be hydrothermal vents, which are sources of, of energy, and bioluminescence, which is the source of uh, light uh, in much of the deep ocean. By way of review, here's that exaggerated cross-section of the ocean. You recall we talked about the continental shelf, the continental slope, the continental rise, the toe of that, of that slope, and then the plain, trench, and, and then the plain is, is punctuated by trenches and islands. And uh, we, we mentioned that much of the shelf was at, 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 with different sea levels um, was probably exposed. So just like the Santa Monica Mountains, the Oxnard Plain, et cetera, uh, look today. Um, we mentioned that the continental slope is on average about four degrees, so it's a pretty it's a pretty even homogeneous slope most of the way down, and yeah. And we talked about these names for things uh, uh, near near the coast or littoral near the bottom benthic up in the water uh, you know away from any walls would be pelagic. Um, and we had the names for uh, the different. Uh, critters based uh, on where they live. And again, the Nuston is the stuff really up close near the near the skin of the ocean. Plankton and Nekton, or, or Plankton and Nekton, if I'm not mumbling my words. Uh, plankton, right, remember they're moving uh, primarily, their movements are primarily dictated by the, the tides and the currents. And then Nekton are able to dis determine for their se themselves wh where they go, regardless of how much the current it might be cranking. And then things that live at the bottom are benthic critters. All good? All right. Most of the... Most of these critters, one of the first passes we can um, use in terms of not a taxonomic breakdown, but a functional breakdown, um, has to do with where these guys get their energy sources. So we can pretty quickly break them down into uh, individuals that um, harness some type of abiotic energy and turn that into chemical energy, biologically available energy. We call those guys autotrophs. And then things that, that get their energy from some other life form, those are heterotrophs, right? So, so they're, they're getting the energy from, ultimately the heterotrophs are getting their energy also from the autotrophs, but, um, but they, have to, they have to eat them or, or consume their, their byproducts to get them. Ooh, good question. So, so, so Finn's question is, what if you have something, let's say, like a zooxanthellae and a coral? So that's an interesting debate. That probably takes lots of beers and lots of hours to talk about. It's not, it's not fully understood is the short answer. What uh, is clear is, is the zooxanthellae, which are, so technically speaking, the coral is not autotrophic itself. But it, ha it has these organelles inside of its tissues that inside of them have essentially slave labor. They have these captured al algal cells, these captured phytoplankton. And they, um, and those phytoplankton leach or, or leak sugars. So they're, they're catching the sun, these, these cells inside the cells of the, inside the body of the coral. 
lights coming through, hitting them, hitting their um, photosystems and exciting those electrons and, and doing all the stuff the photosystems do. And then out it's going to pop some sugar molecules. And those sugar molecules are going to be used by the zooxanthellae. But then some of that's going to leak out. So the, the coral gets the benefit of all of these photosynthesizers. That's why coral looks, all the beautiful pictures you've seen of coral has all these wonderful colors, purples and pinks and greens. That color is coming from uh, these zooxanthellae critters. So the debate is, what do we call that? Now, uh, the, the, the traditional thing is, hey man, the, these, these coral are, are pimping out these uh, zooxanthellae, right? They got them in and they're just doing their bidding. Other people have argued that there's actually a benefit for the zooxanthellae being in there. With the idea being that if you are out floating in the water and you're a phytoplankton, there might be some grazer that comes on by and munches you up and eats you. But if you're hanging out inside the tissues of a coral with all these stinging cells that can you know, attack things and, and, and has a skeletal structure, a rigid structure, um, you actually, <coughs> excuse me, um, thanks. You, you actually might be getting a benefit. So yeah, you're, you're uh, what's the line from that song? You're something, something and working for a living. What's the, taking what I'm given and working for a living? Something like that, right. So, so maybe you're a Huey Lewis fan and you're living inside a coral so, so, so it's not entirely clear if, so it's clear that the coral gets a benefit, but it's not, it, there's a debate as to whether the zooxanthellae are getting a benefit or they're just being sort of, you know, slave labor or what. But, but in that case, um, in, in that case, the zoxan, the, the coral can get some of its energy budget met from the leaching of, of these, uh, these sugars. So in a sense, you can maybe argue that the, the, the coral is autotrophic, right? In the sense that it's, it's, it's doing this harvesting inside its tissues, but the coral will also eat things. So the coral is also heterotrophic. So they're kind of a, a bit of a weird category that in theory can functionally be one or the other. And we have very few, very few critters can do both, but, but a few can. Um, but that points out an interesting thing, right? The ocean, has all kinds of these things, these weird things that don't fit our typical definitions. On land, I, I, can't, I can't think of a system like that on land. Maybe there is one I just can't think of. But all the examples I can think of that are that sort of betwixt between are in the ocean. And we're going to see that more and more as we go on with this lecture. We're gonna, yeah. Oh, uh, mm, yes. Yeah, OK, right. So pitcher plant, maybe. Yeah, so possibly. Technically, I don't believe they're getting energy from the flies and stuff they get. I think they're getting nutrients and oh, stuff. You're right, you're right. So, but, you know, but maybe, I don't know, maybe they're getting a little bit of energy. So possibly, possibly. Um, but good point. I like that. I like that. Other thoughts? Okay, cool. When coral reproduces, does it reproduce with the... Uh, no. So the question is, so when, when coral, when, when you have a little, a little, you know, a male cell, a female cell come together, they do not bring the zooxanthellae with them. So they have to be inoculated. And we don't exactly understand how that happens. Uh, we do know that during a coral bleaching, this is getting off, a little bit off subject, but we, we have a coral bleaching event. What that is, the coral doesn't die. The coral is, is getting rid of its, its zooxanthellae. Usually, <laughs> very quickly right thereafter, it dies. But, but, Technically speaking, the bleaching event is not death. It looks like death to us because all of a sudden we're used to this big, you know, vivacious, really intensely colored critter, and all of a sudden it goes very pale. Um, we we used to think that as soon as they as soon as they bleached, they were dead. Might take a few days, might take a week or two, but they're dead. Now we know that not all of those coral heads die, so some are able to, in a mechanism we don't understand, re recapture zooxanthellae from the from the environment and essentially re-inoculate themselves. It's a small percentage, it's a, it's a very small percentage, but so there is some kind of physiological mechanism that we don't exactly understand. How do these guys find each other? How do they negotiate that? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But good question. 
Okay, so again, uh, so the autotrophs are making their own food from uh, primarily from sunlight. And uh, we've, we've recently discovered, recently as in my lifetime, have discovered this whole other uh, source of energy on Earth. And we'll look at some uh, videos in a, in a bit. Um, and that would be using, um, generating that energy from high energy chemical bonds that come from essentially deep inside the Earth. Um, all right, you guys know this is all basic. Okay, so here we go. Productivity is a key segregator for critters in the world's ocean, and therefore a key segregator of, of populations and therefore resources. So some of these resources we concerns that we have as we go forward, we start talking about fisheries and this and that. Uh, productivity at, at, at a large scale is going to determine where we're fishing, for example. Like several other things in the ocean, Productivity is going to vary with depth. Generally speaking, it is most high. The, the largest biomass is near the skin of the ocean, so really close to the surface. In the so-called photic zone, remember we defined that before. And what's the photic zone? The right, we're, we're photo, photon, right where the light is, so the lit, lit part of the ocean. So we can. So I'm going to give you guys a couple. The last couple of times I said it varies depending on where we are in the ocean and this and that. I'm going to tell you pretty much the, um, the, the rules of thumb that we'll use from here on out. Okay, and these, these are pretty good solid ones. So the euphotic, u meaning true, so the real, the, the true euphotic zone, again, with, with the caveat that this is going to depend on how much sediment is in the water and, and, and a few other things, but, but on average, the, the true photic zone is going to be about uh, the surface to 80 meters in depth. At that depth, we can have net, for many things, net positive photosynthesis. With some critters, it's, 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 it's more shallow than that. But the rule of thumb is pretty much all that photosynthesis we're going to see, generally speaking, is above 80 meters. The, the critter is going to live above 80 meters. Then there's this area of the so-called dysphotic zone. So that means that some, some, some light is getting down there. It's not pitch black, but it's not going to meet our photosynthetic, our physiological demands. So we're going to be burning up more energy than we are producing energy. So you could go, if you're a photosynthetic critter, you could float down into the dysphotic zone for a little bit. Okay, but you can't stay the whole time down there because you'll eventually burn through all your resources. Once we, um, once we leave, once we get deeper than 200 meters, we're essentially always in the aphotic zone, the pure dark zone. So we have the, the photosynthetically can make a living zone, zero to 80 meters. This sort of zone where, yeah, kind of, but not really, you're, you're, you're taking more out of the bank than you're putting deposits in. That's the 80 to 200. And then deeper than 200 is, uh, there's no possible way you can do um, photosynthesis there. That, that technical break where we go from, where, where we go from um, having a net positive uh, generation of energy r relative to our respiration is the so-called critical depth. 